Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the month of March. We have so much going on, and uh, I wanted to spend some time today discussing um, an important aspect of business building, which is time management. And I want to start by kind of prefacing that with an analogy or a metaphor that's been used for, I think, centuries, right? It's um, We've often heard the story of the metamorphosis of the caterpillar into the majestic butterfly and just what a great example that is in nature of how we can transform from our maybe what we interpret as our current shabby self into the glorious best version of our potential right and uh, and we look at that and we go man if, if a caterpillar can do that surely i can do the change that i need to do right and and it's often been a great metaphor that has been used like i said for literally probably millennia um but what's interesting is we often look at the before and after, the caterpillar, the butterfly, but we don't always take time to consider what happens in the middle, right? When it's in that little cocoon, that chrysalis. And what's interesting, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, perhaps you are, but when I discovered this, I was like, man, life, that's just incredible. What do you think happens to the caterpillar when it's in that little chrysalis? What's interesting it, is, oh, was it, someone going to say something? I said it dissolves, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. 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 It, it doesn't grow wings out of its back and get new legs coming out and, and go through some miraculous kind of transformation from what it is to what it becomes. It actually dissolves into this genetic soup, right? And it is completely undone. And when it's in that state, then there are certain DNA, certain cells within it that get activated, they're lying dormant beforehand. But when in that chrysalis, when it's completely undone and dissolved, then they activate. And it's the activation of those new cells in that state that bring about the birth of the beautiful butterfly. It's interesting that. Uh, Lynn. I actually hand raised butterflies and this was incredible to watch how quickly when the chrysalis is ready, it opens up. There is the fluid in the stomach and you can see pumping that fluid to expand into the veins in the wings for the wings to come out. That's mm -hmm. when they're most vulnerable before the wings dry. It is incredible to see. And um, just, <laughs> it's so fun to let child experience something like that. So I've been doing it last year and this year my neighborhood is doing raising butterflies to help out. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I love it. Yeah. yeah. As a kid, I used to love this. My next door neighbor was very kind. She used to get all of these caterpillars in her garden that she would capture and she would help me kind of capture them and kind of look after them and tend to them and uh, watch them grow into these beautiful monarch butterflies, which I was just in awe of. It was just fantastic to see. But it's interesting that, isn't it, that uh, in order for it to become the butterfly, it needs to be completely undone. And that process of time where it's all sealed up uh, inside that cocoon, I think, is something that's really instructive for each of us as we go through our own journey of transformation and becoming in Nikan. I think we all kind of come in as these, but as these caterpillars looking for an opportunity to become something more. That's what humans being more is all about, right? Achieving our full potential. And it's that kind of theme and message, I think that has always captivated me for Niken is that humans being more spirit. And I have to give, of course, a big plug to um, Sherry Danzig hosting uh, with Jeff Isom this weekend, the uh, humans being more in Atlanta. I'm heading over to that in a couple of days, really looking forward to participating. Uh, certainly a highlight of my year when I do that. It's incredible. Um, but it's that, that whole process of wanting to become, right? But, but we need to understand that there is a period of time. And for us as human beings, it's not the same as the caterpillar. For the caterpillar, that period of time, that changing, that transformation, uh, that metamorphosis happens kind of in that one state, in that chrysalis, right? It kind of begins there. But for us, we can go through this multiple times throughout our life, can't we? We can transform and become, and then realize that there is even more to become and go through another transformation and become even more, and then become even more. Because our best self, I don't think we ever fully reach. I think we aspire to it, we reach towards it. We we, we move 
confidently in that direction. But um, it's a, I think our best self is constantly evolving and expanding. So, so I want to talk today about that gap, that little space in between where it, maybe transformation is uncomfortable, unpleasant, difficult, challenging. And, and how do I grapple with that? Because there is that willingness on our part that is necessary to let go and be undone, so to speak, in order for us to transform and become the best self. So sometimes circumstance can inflict that upon us. Sometimes we can do it ourselves uh, and embrace it. But either way, when that, when that moment comes, we do need to grapple with it and be willing to be undone in order for that transformation to be complete moving forward. So I've got some slides I wanna to share today. Um, and give me one second and I will pull them up. Um, so I, I want to first off begin um, by talking about time, because what we're talking about here, as I, as I discuss this process of transformation, uh, is actually quite practical. We're going to go through some practical things today on what can I do to take control of that period of transformation that I might be in, that chrysalis moment uh, that I'm going through and experiencing, and actually do something to take control and come out the other side confidently what I want to be. And that really comes down to time management. I, 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 so I want to start off by this. It's, it's interesting, this. Time management are two words that we've thrown together that we don't always consider, again, what they really mean. When we look at time, for example, we know what time management is. We go, yeah, it's, it's taking control of my time. <laughs> but what is time? And I love this quote. If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asketh, I know not. Uh, could any of you give a good definition, do you think, of time? What would you say it is? Do you want to put something in the chat? See if you can uh, share a comment or two on what you think time is. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quote here from a couple of people that uh, give some good explanations. Uh, Albert Einstein, of course, a good person to go to in discussing time. Time has no independent existence apart from the order of events by which we measure it. And here we go. We've got a German mathematician here saying something similar. Time is merely the order of events, not an entity in itself. So as we look at that, we've got a, some, a comment in the chat here. Um, yeah, Barbara's saying the older we become, the faster time seems to slip away. It's very true, isn't it? Time measures <coughs> uh, uh, is the measurement of our lives. That's very good. These are some good examples here. But what we see here that is common in its definition of time is this word here, events. Time is a measurement, and it measures what? The events in our life. And, of course, the more events we have, as Barbara alludes to as we get older, the faster time seems to pass. But what we certainly realize here is... Time is the continuum in which events succeed from one another from past through present to future. That events are the basic element of time. So when we talk about time management, what we're looking to do is manage or take control of the events in our life. Okay. Um, um, Barbara Batucci, Bob saying that this which you're speaking of is the pause. Uh, in the no longer and the not yet. <laughs> That's really good. The bit that we can control is not the past, not the future, it's the now. Yeah, great point, Bob. Uh, it's, it's really true, this, isn't it? So I want to talk about, first of all, how we can take better use, uh, make better use of our time, take better control of the important events in our life, how to prioritize that, how to get things moving and focused in a way that will help us Um to be more effective and get better results in our business. Okay, Elaine's saying, uh, during prayer, I felt this, uh, I felt time once. It was like a series of rectangular chunks that were designed to help us not be overwhelmed by the enormity of eternity. Well, that is a wonderfully profound insight, Elaine, uh, because certainly what you're identifying there is when we can reduce time into bite-sized manageable pieces, we have a better sense of control and we can minimize the overwhelm. I think that's an incredible, profound insight. So if we want to be effective in our time management, the first thing we've got to do is understand this pyramid of priorities. Okay, so maybe take a screenshot of this. Uh, I would encourage each of you to, as, as we go through our goal setting, 
Uh, Mike talked about goal setting last night in his call, and this kind of prompted the subject a little bit, um, is we want to be able to understand if we're going to create some priorities in our lives and in our business, we've got to go through this pyramid here of governing values at the foundation. What are my governing values? What are my long range goals, my midterm goals, and then my daily tasks? And you see that arrow going through is really designed to say, my governing values should be expressed in how I prioritize my daily tasks. I can't prioritize my daily tasks if I haven't reverse engineered this process and understood, well, what are these daily tasks striving to accomplish in the short term, in the long term, and how does that connect to my governing values? By understanding this, uh, that becomes so much more helpful in the way that we can prioritize. And here's an interesting thought. The word priorities that we use so frequently in our vocabulary, I'll just stop the screen share for just a second, it shouldn't really exist. That, that word shouldn't appear in the English language. It's, it's an evolution of the word priority, right? It came into our language many years after the word priority, but the word priority means the first or prior thing. You can't have multiple firsts. When I'm counting to 10, I don't go one, 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 two, three, four, five, six, right? I don't do that. It's one, two, three, four. It's the first or prior thing. So priorities is really kind of a misconception on what is important. We have priority. What is your number one priority? If you were to look today at what you've got to do in your weekend business, it's very easy to sit down and say, okay, I've got all of these things to do. I'm kind of working through my contact list. I've got these phone calls to make. I've got this appointment that I'm trying to set up. I've got this ABC this afternoon. I'm doing a demonstration with the product uh, with my next door neighbor um, in the evening. You could identify all these different things. Uh, what is the number one most important thing to do today? When, when we don't have a priority and we make everything feel important, it gets really hard to identify what's most important doesn't it? Everything, everything seems like a rush and a hustle and a, and, 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 and a mad kind of panic to get things done. You might compromise yourself a little bit, burn out or experience unnecessary fatigue. So what we want to do is learn to prioritize the most important thing. Yeah. Now, you know, going back to Elaine's point about bite-sized chunks, you might have a, the most important thing happening this afternoon, but what is the most important thing for now, for this moment? OK, so again, like I said, I'm going to jump back to my screen share here and just kind of show that image, because I do think um, this helps us in identifying what is most important. And what I do in my daily tasks really helps me in getting the absolute best out of my time. So what we're talking about today is not identifying what is important to you. That's a task for you to do on your own, so to sit through this and go through it but it's to just give us a reminder of what I'm doing on a daily basis. I should focus first and foremost on the most important things. How do I know what those are? I look to how does this impact my intermediate goals, my long-term goals, and how is it ex an expression of my governing values? If what you're doing on your daily basis, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, for example, with the daily, intermediate, and long-range goals, if they do not align with your governing values, you will have a miserable experience. The quality of our life is proportionate to the quality of our emotions, which means when I can fully embrace all of my governing values and express that to my heart's content in terms of what I'm reaching for, striving for, and acting on right now in the present, I'm going to have a meaningful experience. Even if I'm in that little chrysalis phase of my transformation where it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, I'm being undone by life around me or by my circumstances, or by, by what I'm working through, but that's okay because I know as I am going through that undoing and I am going through that painful transformation, I know that it's taking me somewhere that is wonderful and beautiful. And that can help us certainly wrestle with the uncomfortable moments in the interim. So a couple of ways to help us in understanding what is our number one priority. I like this little, par this little um, graph here of important and urgent. So you've got a kind of this four-way graph of 
obviously their place to focus on is what is important and what is urgent. Okay. Um, now I didn't create this graph. So uh, a crisis in the office, pressing deadlines, going to the gym um, are not necessarily things that I would put in here for Nikan consultants. Okay. But what we do see is urgent and important tasks are things that we do right away. If it's important, but not urgent, then we get to decide if it's urgent, but not important. Maybe we can delegate that out to someone. Okay, maybe you can get someone around you that can provide some support there or work as a team in getting everything accomplished that you need to. If it's not important and it's not urgent, get rid of it. Okay, so you've got the urgent and important. If it's both, we do it. If it's important but not urgent, we can decide, make a choice. If it's not important but urgent, maybe you delegate. If it's, again, not urgent, not important, then delete it from your schedule. I want you to just focus on these two areas here. As you look at your schedule for today and for the rest of the week, do you have things in there that are neither important nor urgent that may be detracting you or distracting you from doing the things that matter most? What is there in your schedule this week that you can delete, that you can remove from your timetable and free your time up? This is a great way to manage our time more effectively. And the antithesis, of course, what is there in my schedule that is important and urgent that maybe I'm not doing yet that I need to make sure I prioritize and lead with that activity versus something else? Okay, so let's look at those. Again, take a screenshot if you wish, because this is a really helpful way of, as we go through that, that pyramid of governing values up to daily tasks, when we get to, into the details where we're bombarded with hundreds of different decisions a day, which we are, we're literally bombarded with hundreds of decisions every single day. Um, then how do, I, how do I decipher? How do I filter through? This really helps us to do that. I wanna talk about this as well. This is kind of the last point I wanna to discuss today. And I think this is really, really important for each of us. The circles of concern versus the circles of control. This is really important. When you look at the things that cause you worry or concern in your life, what are some of the things that come to your attention? What is it that kind of springs to mind? There are some things that we have control over, other things we don't. I'm going to give you an example here, and this is another way that we can improve the efficiency of our time in getting better results in our weekend business and in our life in general, right? Is understanding the difference between these three different circles. They're all related, they're all intertwined, they all connect to our emotions, and they all become an expression of our productivity or our lack of it. Because if we don't differentiate here, we can get distracted to our heart's content uh, throughout any given day. So here's an example of what um, influence of uh, circles of control, influence or concern look like. So let's start on the outside and work in. Okay, as I look at my circle of concern, I might be concerned about war that's taking place in the world, the political framework of the country that I live in, the financial economy, the pandemics that are going on, uh, the weather. Uh, I've moved to Utah over this past year or so. Uh, we've had incredible snowstorms. It sucks. It causes me a little bit of concern. I've been, I've been blocked in a few times over the last couple of weeks. Um, circle of influence. But, but, but here's the thing, going to circle of concern. It can worry me because it may affect my life. But what control do I have on my circle of concern? Can I, um, um, you know, how much involvement can I get in my worry over the weather, the worry over the pandemics that have been experienced, the war in the Ukraine, for example, between Ukraine and Russia? Yeah, how much I, I can be worried and concerned. How much influence do I have here? Maybe not a lot, right? Now let's look at the circle of influence. This might be my team's behavior, the company culture. Uh, the success of people that join my business, my team's retention rates, my promotional activities that I'm working with prospects on and what have you. That can be all sorts of things here that I have influence on, but not direct control. Okay, so I can certainly influence it, impact it, but I don't have total control. And so you, you kind of got your, I mean, <laughs> your, your, your personal group activity there is a great example of your circle of influence, right? But your circle of control is you. It's my thoughts, 
It's my actions. It's my response to circumstances. It's my attitude. It's my enthusiasm. It's me, 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 me. What do I have control over? And mostly I have control over what I think and what I feel and what I do, right? In those three examples, I have a circle of control. That control, of course, when I start to govern myself very well, does start to ripple, ripple out into my circle of influence. And my circle of influence can then certainly expand significantly and start to impact the circle of concern. So it does all go out, but isn't it interesting how it all starts with me? So let's take a look at this and identify what are the things in our circle of influence? Okay, this is what we want to do. How do I identify what's in my circle of concern? and what item should be located in my circle of influence. So here's a task. Again, take a screenshot if you want. This is being recorded. You can come back and watch it again if you want to take uh, some notes later. But this is what I want you to do as you're building out your governing values, your long-term goals, midterm, daily tasks, looking at the interconnectedness of them all, understanding what is important and urgent and what is what can be deleted from my schedule because it is not important and it is not urgent. Let's also understand the difference between influence and control. Here's something that we can do to make that happen. Let's take a list of all the things that, you draw, that you're concerned about. Draw a big circle around it. It's going to be a big list, <laughs> perhaps, right? Then on that same sheet, draw a smaller circle inside the larger one, which is your circle of concern. Uh, in, in, inside your circle of concern, which is your circle of influence. Now let's take a look at all the things here that you're concerned about uh, that you have influence over. What are they? And it's when we start to do this and understand, I'm going to go back to this here. When I start to look at all of the things that I'm concerned about, but then all of the things that I have influence on and all the things I can control, then we start to make a different decision when it comes to how I use my time. Like I said before, time is essentially taking control of the events in our life. The one constant in that whole definition of what time is, is events. If I want to take better control of my life, I learn to master the events that are happening within it. And we start by prioritizing, understanding what matters most, how that connects to our intrinsic values, and then differentiating between what I worry about and what I can control. And of course, what I can influence. And when I look through that lens in my Niken business, then I will start to take very different action. It would be really interesting to get some feedback, maybe at our next call or maybe in a week or so, as, as to how I govern my time differently as a result of these couple of insights here or practices. I don't expect that this is all new information to you, right? This, this is kind of regular stuff that we've probably heard a thousand times. Okay, I'm not trying to be new here in what I'm sharing. What I am wanting to do is remind each of us that as we reflect and reconnect to really prioritizing the most important thing and focusing on the now, on the present, and making sure that what we do connects with our governing values and that we can differentiate between what we can control and what we are simply concerned about. And then we take action on what we can manage and what we have influence on and control over. Then something interesting happens self-esteem grows. There is a direct correlation between our self-esteem and our ability to take control of the events in our lives. So when we feel like we're in control, our self-confidence grows. When we feel like we lack it, our self-confidence diminishes. Now, what happens when our self-confidence diminishes to our actions? They get compromised. We do less because we believe less. Why do we believe less? because we feel like we're not in control. Right. So what do we do to reverse that? What can I control? Let's start there. What I believe, uh, what I think, how I feel, my emotions, and my actions that I take. What can I influence? I can team up with people in my organization and we can influence things together there. When we start to do that, we start to see measurable, quantifiable things that are changing as a result of our actions. And our confidence goes up. And when our confidence goes up, our belief improves, and then our actions are enhanced and enriched, and we get even, and our emotional state is improved, and it becomes a virtuous circle upwards. But it all comes back down to that one point. It starts with me. It starts with me. 
And the best place to start is with the most important thing on my plate today, right now. Not the past, not the future, the present. The, and the present is the moment that we're in right now. So I hope this has been helpful, a good reminder to each of us to just get focused on the important and the urgent and the necessary. Understand what I can control, grab a hold of that, wrestle with it. If it's uncomfortable and unpleasant for a season while you're doing that, that's okay. Maybe you're just in that little chrysalis right now and you're going through a mighty metamorphosis and transformation to become something even more majestic and more beautiful than you already are. And that's a good thing, right? So thank you so much. I hope this has been a help. Absolutely love you guys. And um, just more than once a month. Uh, Bob, yeah, no, I'm doing these calls once a month. If people have a strong interest to reconnect as a follow-up to this, um, then maybe we can do that. Um, but I'll, I'll respond to that you know, on, a, on a needs basis, I think. Um, but yeah, let's, let's do it. So thank you all very much. And we'll see you uh, later on. Take care. Great call. Thank Reminder you. to everyone that we go forward this weekend. Speaking of time, then mm. spring we spring forward this weekend. Oh yes, good reminder. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Ben. Great call. Thank you, Ben. Great call.